sound. He's got a turbo. I don't know exactly how much horsepower he's carrying, but that much juice would usually hurt his control, especially in the turns. A turbo in that car is a loose cannon, but somehow he's finding a way to control it. As much as we hear about turbocharged engine and media from car enthusiasts or commercials about cars, what exactly is a turbo? How did they come about? And why is it even important to know any of this? In this video, we're covering the history of the turbocharged engine and the most important car regarding this topic, the car that saved the turbo. You'll want to stick around until the end because we'll cover various methods of turbo setups as well. To begin, we'll need to start on what a turbo is and where it started, because if you don't know your history, then you won't have much of a future or even a sense of appreciation for the technology we have now. But don't worry, we're building up to the really fun stuff soon enough. A turbocharger or turbo is a turbine-driven forced induction device. The concept of the turbocharger goes back into the early 20th century. It was first designed by the Swiss engineer named Alfred Bucci in 1905. He referred to this design as an exhaust-driven pre-compression system. It consisted of a radial flow compressor paired with an exhaust-driven axial flow turbine. The exhaust gases from the engine are used to spin the turbine, which is connected to the compressor via a common shaft. What the hell is that supposed to mean? In simpler terms, when the engine's exhaust gas flows through the turbine and spins it, this then powers the compressor, allowing it to pull in fresh air to make it denser. The compressed, dense air is then fed into the engine, allowing the engine to burn fuel more efficiently, resulting in increased power output and performance. Bucci was working on ways to improve the power output of diesel engines for marine and industrial applications, and yet most notably it would greatly help in the aviation industry. But do you know why? It's because the higher the plane travels in height or its altitude, the thinner or less dense the air becomes. With a lack of airflow into the engine, it would start losing power. This is what causes a plane to stall out, which in 1915 is where Bucci's completed turbine prototype comes in to compact that air, providing the needed power for planes to travel at higher altitudes, at least in theory. The turbine system Bucci worked on turned out to not work in practice. However, during the events of the First World War, the United States commissioned for a solution to the aircraft problem based on Bucci's patent. And by 1918, Sanford Moss from General Electric successfully tested a turbocharged Liberty V-12 engine, reaching up to 14,000 feet above sea level, a vast improvement from the 10,000 to 12,000 prior, proving that turbochargers could maintain engine performance in low-pressure environments, especially considering how in 1920, the French plane, the Lusak 11, was able to reach heights of 33,000 feet. From this point onward, the use of turbochargers would be included on airplanes and ships, Bucci himself making a successful turbo for ships in 1925. Especially during events of World War II with collaborations between General Electric and Ford, all thanks to Bucci's original designs. This also includes the Bell Electronics presents B-17 Bomber. B-17 Bomber. At this point, you might be wondering how this translates into cars? Simple. With the results from how effective the turbo has proven to be over the previous decades, it would only be a matter of time before attempting similar for the automotive field, with attempts started as early as the 1950s. However, it wasn't until 1962 comes the Oldsmobile Jetfire and Chevrolet Corvair Monza Spider were introduced as the first commercial cars on the market with a turbo. Jetfire's got the sensational power and acceleration of the revolutionary turbo rocket engine, a turbocharged fluid-injected V8. The Jetfire featuring a V8 turbo rocket engine requiring a specific turbo rocket fluid. Otherwise, the engine would cap its performance to keep the components from tearing itself apart. Turbo rocket fluid, gasoline and air are blended in the exhaust-driven compressor. Accelerate sharply, and the turbocharger whirls at incredible speed, packing the fuel mix into the engine. Result? Compression zooming upward, and that enormous surge of jet fire power. This also being the first use of water methanol injection systems. Unfortunately, because the technology was still new, these cars failed commercially due to the reliability issues, and people using cheap substitutes such as tap water, leading to people seeing the turbo as a lemon, or a car that's a defective dud. Even though these cars failed commercially, there was still more room for improvement which in 1965 the Scout was able to demonstrate. It's a 4x4 four four four-wheel drive that lasted on the market for two years before being replaced with a non-turbo engine. But it was the first car to use a turbo without the water meth injection. By 1975, the world was getting through the 1973 oil crisis. 
for the embargo of oil from Arab members of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries because of the United States providing support to Israel during the Arab-Israeli War. How original. Porsche entered the game in utilizing the turbocharged engine. This resulted in the creation of the 911 Turbo. Yes, this is the very same 911 Turbo that became known as Tatsuya's Blackbird, and eventually a familiar white 935 Turbo, which is the 911 redesign with racing specs, otherwise remembered as the alternate mode of the Generation 1 Autobot. Jazz. There's a flurry in a hurry. Or even the 911 Type 964 that Mirage uses in Rise of the Beasts. Come on. Wu-Tang is in the building, baby! This car is perhaps the most important. While the others previously mentioned have great significance in the history of the Turbo, the 911 Turbo was the turning point that convinced the world that the Turbo was a desirable addition. From the smooth curves of the body to the whale tail spoiler, this is the car that the general public associated the Turbo from a lemon, the power and speed. Starting to see why knowing your history is important. Otherwise, you miss fun details like these and the end product has no value other than the primitive mindset of car move faster. Even so, the turbo still had a great deal of turbo lag, much like the short-lived BMW 2002 turbo, or the delay in a turbocharged engine's response when the driver accelerates. The technology was getting there, but not quite at the point it needed to be. In 1977, the addition of an intercooler was added to the turbo system. This massively helped increase the power from 260 horsepower to 300 another important addition to what is still seen in the turbo today. Around this time, more commercial vehicles with a turbo were being introduced. Saab with a 99 turbo, a Mercedes 300 SD which used turbo on a diesel engine. Even motorcycles started using turbo in their engines. But that didn't last long. No, we won't cover motorcycles on this channel. The 80s was a time the turbo flourished and was a vast improvement from what came before. The Maserati Bi Turbo being the first twin turbo engine, and Porsche 959 with a sequential turbo. This twin turbo setup meant having one turbo operate a low and the other a high RPM range. As time went on, more turbos were designed and implemented to reduce turbo lag. The 1988 Honda Legend had a 2 liter V6 engine that used a water cooled variable geometry turbo. Then, in 1989, Mazda introduced twin scroll technology to help reduce turbo lag even further, allowing a more responsive twin rotary engine the very same second generation Savannah RX-7, otherwise known as the FC. A fantastic car, while not as much a sports car as the FD, is still a phenomenal piece of machinery. Japan continued to introduce the turbo to many other of its cars, including the Nissan Fairlady Z, Toyota Supra and MR2, Nissan Skyline GTR32, the often forgotten Honda City Turbo, like Skids, Mitsubishi Starion, which became the blueprint to the now Lan Evo, once the 90s came around, turbo was a regular part of the modding scene. Many people would slap a turbo onto anything and everything with an engine. The aftermarket would respond with all kinds of setups, injectors, and computerized devices to go with more technically advanced vehicles. Europe tried to capitalize with a turbo diesel engine, but this didn't last long mainly due to environmental concerns. But it's thanks to the turbo, engines can downsize making cars lighter and requiring less power to move the vehicle. With more standard road vehicles, this allows for larger and more spacious cars. The next logical step to take the turbo is with hybrid and electric engines. The further we come along in technology, the less turbo lag there is, which maximizes the full benefits of the turbo without the drawbacks. Now that you have an understanding on the turbo and its history, hopefully you'll have a greater appreciation of this enhancement, even with its drawbacks and bumpy development. Next time, we'll be covering the turbo and its various add-ons, comparing it to the supercharger, if you enjoyed this video, then like and subscribe for more content on the way. Any bit of support helps in the long run. Let us know in the comments specific topics you want to see covered. It can be on media around cars or even ways to maintain your ride. Remember, keep those engines roaring and stay tuned for the follow-up.